Thank you for those who have been filling these forms out. And if you would like to, you can hand me some after I stand at the door. And those of you involved in prison ministry, may the Lord bless you in your outreach. Do you like to travel? Do you like to fly? I hate flying. <laughs> you have long legs and seats are so close together. And if Karen and I fly together, she gets stuck in the middle. <laughs> but travel is wonderful, isn't it? Traveling is wonderful. Where would you like to travel to? Back to home. Holland. Karen's always wanted to go to Holland. Maybe South America. Or Central America. Have some pupusa. Some specialty food that's only made in El Salvador. Well, other places make it, but they don't make it with the unique cheese that's only available in El Salvador. Or maybe Europe. Or maybe the United States outside of Florida, that is. Or Somalia. Karen's dad and his wife were medical missionaries in Somalia. Or Asia. It's amazing to travel the world and see how the Adventist church functions in different parts of the world. Like this morning, you had a tithe envelope, or you had a piece of paper that you could fill out and give input to the ministry team, mission team, about how the things you like about this church and the direction you like to see this church travel. Well, I was at an African church and most of the people were illiterate. So a piece of paper with something to write on was be absolutely worthless. And they couldn't afford tithe envelopes, so they just put their money in the offering box. Well, as you open your Bibles to Mark chapter 15, Looking again at verses 21 and 22. We find a man in the Bible who's going on a journey. A journey that he loves to make. All three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of the synoptic Gospels, tell us that his name is Simon from Cyrene. And that he's from Cyrene is what we would call modern-day Libya. So it's about a 600 mile trip by boat, by camel, and by foot. And Mark mentions his name because it's, it's apparent that he is well known among first century uh, Christians. Remember, Mark is writing to Christians who live in Rome, and they would have known him. And, and he traveled not just to go someplace. But he was on a mission. He was headed to Jerusalem. He wanted to go and participate in the Passover. And back in those days, there was no Uber or Uber, and there was no Allegiant Airlines. So it took him probably a month to a month and a half from Libya all the way to Jerusalem. And he finally got there, and the city was packed with people. Hotels were hard to find, and the prices were terrible. But he was confused by all the commotion. There was a lot of shouting and a lot of crying. And he saw the soldiers forcing three men on a death march. He saw them carrying their be these, the beams, the part of the cross. Those beams weighed up to 100 pounds. The entire cross weighed up to 250 pounds, so they only carried the beams themselves. This segment of Mark's Gospel is a very dark, long, sad story. It is the ending of Christ's ministry here on earth. And what Jesus endured for us as he traveled that 5,280 feet, as he made that journey, beaten and abused and carrying that 100-pound beam on his back, 
We can't even begin to imagine what it was like. In fact, the word excruciating originates out of the experience of the crucifixion. Crucifixion was, without a doubt, man's worst creation of torture and pain and death. And it was something that the first century Christians knew a lot about. Because the Roman government would use it against them. It was so common that the, that the Roman soldiers had a place outside the city limits just for crucifixions. And early in his ministry, Jesus knew that he would go to Golgotha, the Aramaic word for it, the skull. And the agony that Jesus endured, he did it for us. He did it to open the door of salvation. Now, if you're in Mark 15, if you just slide up a few verses to Mark 15, verse 15, we find Pilate. Pilate is a politician who, who looks to say which way the wind is blowing. And on that day, it was blowing with the crowds that were crying out, crucify Jesus. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas. Now remember Barabbas, Barabbas was a self-declared Messiah. He was a thief, a murderer, a man you just didn't trust, a man you didn't like walking behind you. But he was a Messiah, one of thousands who declared themselves that way. And he delivered Jesus and he had him scourged to be crucified. The audience that Mark is talking to, the Roman Christians, they knew what scourging was. They knew it was a heavy leather whip with either bones or metal at the end that would tear into the flesh. It only, it only helps us to begin to imagine the price that Jesus paid for us. And Simon is looking not into the eyes of the two prisoners, the two thieves, but he's looking into the eyes of Jesus. And he has pity on Christ because Christ is struggling to carry that weight. And the purpose of scourging people was so they would die quickly on the cross. They would lose so much blood that they'd be so weakened that they would not last long. Although they, long is a relative term. The average person on the cross lived about four days. And Simon sees that Jesus is struggling. The soldiers see that Jesus is struggling. And they lift the, the Zara Vedra says that, that, that they lift the cross, the, the cross beam, and put it back on his shoulder, and he stumbles again. And finally, they stop the procession, and they look for someone to carry that beam. Now, no Jew would volunteer to carry it, because to carry that beam for someone who's about to be crucified would make them unclean, and they couldn't participate in Passover. Rather ironic, isn't it? They're looking at the Passover lamb. They don't want to carry his beam. And the Romans would not carry it because crucifixion was disgraceful. And no Roman citizen would be crucified. That's why when you, when you read in Desire of Ages or the Acts of the Apostles about Paul's death, he's beheaded because Roman citizens are not crucified. It was only fit for non-Romans. So they look for someone. And then they see Simon and his pity. Now, what the soldiers are doing is not an act of compassion. It's an act of necessity. They need to keep marching to the cross. But there is something rather ironic, something amazing. Jesus, when he, when he makes that one mile journey to Golgotha, to the skull, he's going to hang on the cross. <clears throat> And Simon's sins are going to be hanging on that cross, just like ours did. But Jesus needed Simon to carry the cross for him, because he couldn't do it. 
Jesus did for Simon what Simon couldn't do for himself. Jesus did for us what we can't do for ourselves. He bore our sins. But Simon could do something for Jesus and carry that 100 pound beam. And Jesus needs us to be his hands and his feet and his mouth to be witnesses to family and to friends and to neighbors. It is an honor for us to share the good news of the gospel that Jesus died on that cross to save us from our sins. Now Mark 15, 21 tells us the name of Simon Cyrene, who like I said told was from Lydia, Libya, excuse me. And he mentions his sons, Mark mentions his sons, Alexander and Rufus. Now, Paul makes a reference to a Rufus, but there's no way of knowing if this is the same Rufus, because I suspect Rufus was probably a pretty common name. And what we learn from the Desire of Ages is that Rufus and Alexander were believers in Jesus Christ. They were followers of Christ. Simon of Cyrene was not yet a follower of Christ. But carrying that beam, it changed his life. He was a new man, as Paul says, a new man in Christ. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ as a result of that experience. Now just think, had Simon left his village five minutes later or five minutes earlier, had he walked a little faster or walked a little slow for that 30 days or more, had he lodged on the other side of Jerusalem, had he gone to a different gate to access that area, he would have missed Jesus. He would have missed that life-changing experience. But there he was, verses 21 and 22, there he was looking at this scene, at this death march. Now the hills of Golgotha are located just outside the walls of Jerusalem. And the crowd is mocking Jesus. Now the irony here is, and it's important not to miss it, is that a week before they were cheering Jesus. Remember that? Yeah. As, that as that procession was taking place and Jesus was on his donkey, all symbolic of a king marching into his capital. And they were laying down branches and even their, their clothing. They were laying it down and singing songs of Hosanna. Here is our king. But in Mark 15, they're mocking Jesus. They're crying for his death. Crowds are finical, aren't they? They're finicky. They, 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 they change. Mark doesn't tell us this, like none of the gospel writers know, but Ellen White tells us that, that Satan and his angels, dressed as humans, we're in those crowds, exciting the people to start crying out against Jesus. Because the crowd could not fit into their, into their minds that this crucifixion was not just another prisoner, not just another individual. This was the Paschal Lamb. This was the Lamb of God which was slain from the foundation of the world. This was an event for the entire universe. And all they could think of was to say, crucify him. They were witnessing the greatest thing that ever had happened in the history of the universe. And they missed it. We're like those crowds. We, we, we want God to fix our problems immediately. We come to church and we sing our songs. We like to compartmentalize our life. God, you can have this part, but you can't have this part. And sometimes we say, you know, God, if, if you are the God of the universe, why do you let these things happen? Sometimes we think that we know better than God. And the crowd did, and they missed the whole point. Notice verse 17. It says, And they, they is referring to the soldiers, clothed him with purple 
and planted a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Verse 19, And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him, bowing their knees and worshiping him. Verse 20, And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, put his own clothes on, and led him out to be crucified. The soldiers thought they were being funny as they humiliated Jesus. They had no clue who was standing before them. They said, you, so you're the king, here's your crown. So you're the king, here's your purple robe. And they mocked him, just as the crowd mocked him. And they would say to him, if you are the king, if you're the son of God, if you're, if you're the king of kings, come down from the cross and save yourselves. Save yourself. So the one thing they were requesting was the worst thing possible. Had Jesus come down from that cross, we'd be lost. We'd be hopeless. We would live a life of, of darkness and despair. But Jesus endured the torture and the humiliation. We would respond with anger and pride and fear and greed. But Jesus suffered all those things. And being the king of the Jews required him to go to the cross. Taking the humiliation and the shame, it's all part of that sacrifice. He was the creator of the universe. Nails are driven in his hand. As the creator of the universe, those nails were useless. But he allowed them to be driven into his hands and feet. Just think, there were people in that crowd who Jesus healed. There were people in that crowd that he had driven evil spirits away. The storm listened to him. He rose Lazarus from the grave. He was the creator of the universe. But he chose on that day to be the Passover lamb. Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Leviticus 17 is looking forward to this very day in Mark 15 when Jesus is surrendering himself as the Passover lamb. If he had come down from that cross, he would be saying that there was a limit to his love. But instead he fulfilled prophecy. So if you hold Mark 15 and flip over to one of our favorite chapters of the Bible, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 describes this time in the life of Christ. 53, beginning with verse 3. Are you there? Isaiah says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5, For he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. Verse 6, We like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord had laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Verse 23, Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. He didn't take that painkiller because he wanted to be focused on the mission that he was called to fulfill, which is saving mankind. He wanted to be fully awake despite the pain that he was in. So it was the greatest act of self-control. An all-powerful God denies himself the privilege of a painkiller. 
Jesus is telling us, I will do anything for you. I will go to any <coughs> length for your salvation. And that's the king that Simon of Cyrene met. The king of the Jews. The true sacrificial lamb. The true king. So Simon of Cyrene gets eye to eye to Jesus. He's looking him in the eyes as the soldiers are expecting him to carry that beam. And he doesn't see anger that he sees in the eyes of the other two men. He sees compassion. He sees love and forgiveness. He sees eyes filled with gratitude. He sees a, a king, a Passover lamb, loves everybody. The good and the bad. And with every insult, Jesus takes another step closer to Golgotha. With people mocking him, Jesus hangs from the cross and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Simon stepped out of the crowd and his life was changed. Simon missed going to Passover, but he realized that he was carrying the beam for the true Passover lamb. So my friends, it's a great story and it's a great read. But are you prepared to carry your cross for Jesus? Are you prepared take whatever sacrifices are necessary. I, I know we live in an age when sacrifice is not a very nice word. But that's the message that Mark is giving to us. Are you willing to be a Simon of Siren to do whatever is necessary for the cause of Christ, for the kingdom of heaven? See, carrying the cross of Jesus it means that we place all that God wants above all that we want. It means that we treasure Jesus more than we treasure our resources, our homes, our cars, our jet skis, our iPads. It means that we treasure Jesus more than we treasure our comforts. It means that we give our dreams to God and let Him dream for us. Take up your cross. Many of us are like Simon of Cyrene. We don't come to church with the idea of carrying a cross. God says, wherever you are, whatever your situation is, God says, I can use you. You might say to yourself, oh, I'm just not smart enough, I'm just not educated enough, I'm, I, I, I can't sing, I can't pray in public. We have a whole list of litanies of what we can't do. And God says, I can use you where you are. Jim Elliott was a missionary to Ecuador, to one of the worst, most dangerous tribes in Peru. In his journal he wrote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Are you prepared to deny, to deny yourself and take your cross? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I can't even begin to imagine what Jesus went through for us. But Lord, I thank you that you give us the privilege of serving you. That you give us the privilege of carrying the cross. Help us, Lord, not to be angry when things don't go our way. Help us not to be intimidated when Satan throws roadblocks in our path. But by your power, by the power of your Holy Spirit, let us carry the cross that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen.